I'm super excited to launch this webcast with Professor John Paulus, who is an author, a popular public speaker, and former monthly correspondent for abcnews.com, along with Scientific America and The Guardian. Professor of Math at Temple University in, Philip, in Philadelphia, he earned his PhD in the subject from the University of Wisconsin. He's also received a number of very prestigious awards, including in 2003, the American Association for the Advancement of Science Award for promoting public understanding of science. In 2013, the Mathematics Communication Award from the Joint Policy Board for Mathematics. In other words, Professor Paulus is a seasoned expert communicator. So we want to get into his mind to see how it was constructed to allow him these superpower communication skills. Professor Paulus's books include In Numeracy, Beyond Numeracy, A Mathematician Reads a Newspaper, which by the way was on the New York Times for 18 weeks, A Mathematician Plays the Stock Market, Irreligion, and lastly, an autobiography, A Numerate Life. Welcome, John. I'm very pleased wow. to have you on the show today and to start with your reading history from the beginning, those books that came to you that ignited a fire for learning, for reading, and for understanding, and one that obviously has been there your entire life. So if you can maybe just, before we get to the specific books, start a little bit about the context in which the young John Paulus suddenly discovered the world of words. Well, first, uh, thanks for that very kind invitation, Chris, uh, introduction, Christopher. Um, as far as that, it's, it's actually hard for me to say. I, I, I read, I thought, I, I, it, I don't know the exact uh, uh, effect of <clears throat> books in general or a particular book. I mean, I, excuse me, I've listed a number of books that uh, I remember reading and uh, being impressed by. And um, I also was very, very uh, that uh, without the benefit of a book, uh, I mean, a book may, might have triggered an idea or some phrase that uh, some, my father used or some friends of my parents used, and I think about what that meant. But um, I always had a very skeptical frame of mind. I, mean, I remember as a little kid, uh, just being a very young kid, being amused by the fact that dog and God were uh, permutation. The letters uh, were just permuted. And I remember telling my parents, and uh, I thought it was a great discovery. <laughs> but um, in any case, uh, I, I, that's one reason I was drawn to a number of the books I've listed. Even Montaigne was a, a kind of a, a gentle skeptic, and certainly Bertrand Russell was. And um, I've uh, always kind of resonated with, with that. I mean, and um, also with a kind of a natural tendency to debunk. I remember, um, uh, <clears throat> I think I tell this story in a numeric life, I figured out that um, the earned run average of a, a pitcher for the Milwaukee Braves was 135. You don't have to know what that is, but it's very unusual. He got one batter out, and he uh, allowed five earned runs. And I remember telling that to my teacher, uh, fourth grade, third grade teacher, um, during a discussion of sports, and he was a martinet, big guy, bulbous nose, and drank a lot. And he said, that's impossible. Uh, I can only have an earned run average of 27. He told me to sit down. And uh, yes, I was a little, I, would, I was very shy. My face got red, my voice quavered, my hands shook. Uh, but anyway, at the end of the season, the Milwaukee, Brave, the Milwaukee Journal published the earn run average, published statistics for every player during the year. This particular pitcher never came back. So his earn run average for the year was 135. And I remember bringing it in, bringing the newspaper in and showing it to my uh, teacher. And um, he looked at it and told me to sit down. But I, I remember that I, I hit the look on his face. See, he knew I was right. I knew I was right. 
And it, it imparted a kind of lesson to me that with a little logic, a little, uh, a little bit of arithmetic, uh, you could uh, vanquish a blowhard, no matter how shy you were. And that, I think, informed my, um, uh, uh, some of my work and numeracy and uh, arithmetician reason newspaper, some of my columns. So um, that's one of the reasons I listed Bertrand Russell as, as uh, a very important influence. I mean, he was an so, so really, the, 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 the reading then, I, I, I'm kind of interested, did you grow up in a reading culture or was it more kind of an independent thing that came to you through some other source? Uh, it wasn't particularly a reading culture. I mean, my uh, you know, I, my father was interested in such things, but we didn't have a lot of books in the house. And um, uh, but I, you know, I found books. I found Montaigne, for example, my uncle's uh, at my grandmother's house, uh, my on my uncle's book uh, bookshelf. And um, I remember being just shocked that uh, that you could just write things in a very informal way uh, about your everyday experiences and have it be conversational and humorous, and skeptical, reasonable. And, um, and I, uh, you know, that, that, that struck me. You could do that in a way looking back. Yeah. Remember, I mean, a, a Seinfeld show that people characterized it as being about nothing. It was a, and in a way, Montaigne was uh, kind of a 16th century Seinfeld because it was about nothing and every day, just everyday things. And I remember, you know, wanting to do that. I, mean, I, uh, I wrote up uh, some uh, what I had to do to listen to uh, Milwaukee Braves baseball games when I was visiting my grandparents during the summers in Denver. And I would lie down next to this uh, radio as big as a a refrigerator and was very staticky and I would write out where to sit and what the, what snacks to get, grapes and, or uh, uh, candy of one sort or another, cookies, and uh, just uh, the directions. I mean, to close the door so my brothers didn't come in and bother me. And uh, it was my uh, very early imitation of a Montaigne essay. It wasn't very good, as you can probably tell from the summary I just I gave you of it. But um, it uh, nevertheless uh, did have uh, that impact on me that you could just, you know, write about anything. And um, <clears throat> I mean, the details of the stories uh, aren't, you know, don't stick with me. But uh, a lot of times just the, the feeling tone and uh, the general uh, approach does have an impact. You know, w one of the things that's always impressed me about you, John, is the fluency of language and mathematical talent and skill. Normally, those two things don't coalesce inside one brain. Mm -hmm. For some reason, they seem to coalesce well. You have become one of the premier communicators of the mathematical language to a world which is basically innumerate, and as a result, have been able to create a bridge. Now, you've created a language bridge to two language bridges. One language is mathematics, one language is in words. So really today, I'm really interested in how that reading of language have assisted you in becoming this excellent communicator of original ways of looking at mathematical problems, of problem solving, and puzzles. Because I know you're a big fan of puzzles and how to figure them out. Uh, well, I was always interested in, in writing as well as in math. I was good at math, but I enjoyed writing. I mean, in, in college, I, uh, you know, I ultimately got a PhD in mathematics, but as an undergraduate, I made, majored in a number of things. I, I always came back to math. I majored in philosophy for a while, in English. I went to write and uh, uh, physics and uh, and I kept coming back to math but uh, I always enjoyed writing and I enjoyed humor and uh, writing jokes or hearing jokes which are a kind of puzzle in fact I wrote a book mathematics and humor which looks at the similarities between uh, mathematics and humor which uh, are quite uh, quite extensive actually but, um, I mean, they're, they're both forms of intellectual play, uh, combinatorics, reversals, uh, 
uh, ingenuity, cleverness, logic, pattern are essential to both. Uh, Reductio ad absurdum uh, plays a role in math as well as in humor and, and, um, and for different ways. Brevity is important. I, I think brevity is uh, is essential, I mean, not just in, um, in humor, but in mathematics. I mean, it's one difference between mathematics and literature. Somebody writes an extensive uh, treatment of um, proofs, for example, and uh, or Kafka, or whatever, and that's... 400 pages long, and then somebody else writes one that's 600 pages long, the latter one is deemed better. Whereas in mathematics, if somebody has a proof that's six pages long of some theorem, and somebody else has one that's two pages long, that's the, the shorter one is is better. I mean, there's a well-known uh, quote attributed to various people, including Pascal, where he, he tells his interlocutor, uh, he apologizes for writing a long letter, he says he didn't have time to write a short one. And I think uh, brevity has also appealed to, always appealed to me. And, and puzzles uh, always result in a kind of aha moment. Uh, and it's like a punchline to a joke. So, um, yeah, I, um, I'm wondering, I just pause there for a second, that it, there's sure. an interesting connection between the, the mathematical world and the world of, of, of literature. Both have a mission of trying to make predictions about for how you would solve a puzzle, how you would do a particular thing in, in a particular order and predict the outcome of that. So that you obviously have learned to be a superpowered predictor. And the, the mathematician on the stock market, for example, is, is your exploration of using those skills in terms of prediction ability. Now, we also have those skills from literature, from books. We try to predict the motives and intentions and behavior of other people. And I think that's one of the reasons that people who have or extraordinary minds, original minds, are better predictors. Perhaps. Uh, I, I, I think uh, I'm not a particularly good predictor of the stock market. I don't think anybody is. Uh, but um, but I, I know what you mean. I, I, I wouldn't sign on necessarily to the word prediction, though. But um, I mean, actually, my approach to uh, the popular books I have written in mathematics uh, uh, uses uh, little stories, vignettes, uh, jokes, uh, parables to explain mathematical ideas the gist of them rather than formulas or equations. And often you can get across the gist of an idea more effectively by uh, an appropriately constructed uh, uh, little parable, parable or uh, vignette. Mm. And um, and that, that's what I tried to do often in my columns. I mean, sometimes it's not possible, but often it is. And Martin Gardner is a, is a master of that. that and he was, uh, his books were one of the, um, uh, were influential on me when, uh, had an influence on me as I was growing up. He, he's probably been more, more responsible for math PhDs than any 10 math departments in the country. Right. And I'm let's, really John, let, let's, let, let, so sorry to interrupt, but I, 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 no, I want to no go back to what you were talking about earlier, the, the, the short and uh, essay uh, brevity right. in writing. This takes back to Michel Montag, which is the first on your list of books that you yeah. uh, that you list. And I know he's done essays on sadness and sorrow, of consciousness, of smells. Uh, one of his quotations is: "Is marriage is like a cage. One sees the birds outside desperate to get in, and those on the inside desperate to get out." So I can see these kind of pithy uh, phrases out of Montauk would have had a certain appeal to you. Tell us a little bit about the context in which you came to these essays and the kind of influence that they've had on you. Well, I found the book in my uncle's bookshelf. He was much uh, 12 years older than, my, uh, than, than I am. And uh, I uh, just read it. I had never heard of Montaigne, but I I was, as I said, I was just kind of shocked that someone could write about, in a sense, 
nothing all that uh, profound, but yet be uh, very intriguing and, uh, you know, provide a bit of uh, kind of compelling insight to uh, friendship or loss or uh, being presumptuous or whatever. And uh, again, the, the details uh, escape me now, but I, I remember reading through most of the book and just being impressed that um, somebody could do that. And uh, I, in, in addition to the little thing I wrote about listening to a baseball game uh, under the radio as big as a refrigerator, I, I wrote little little pieces that uh, I, I generally threw away, but uh, it uh, it did inspire me uh, to uh, play around with, with writing, I mean, outside of uh, school, and uh, play around with the notion of, a, of an essay. I mean, in a sense, Montaigne uh, invented the what we call an essay to get today. Yes. Yes, he did. You know, it's interesting because he's also known for someone who valued example and experience over abstract knowledge. And I think that's probably a reasonable description of your approach to the books you've written. Uh, I don't know. I value abstract knowledge, too. It's just that I think you can communicate it via, at, uh, <laughs> you know, via stories. I mean... Um, I mean, uh, Russell said that mathematics uh, had a beauty cold and austere. That's true, but um, it it develops out of much warmer, more visceral ingredients. I mean, you learn about geometry by putting, uh, in, you know, some generalized sense, putting sticks together. You learn about arithmetic by adding and subtracting uh, stones. Uh, you learn about uh, you know, probability by noticing things happen often or not. And uh, so you kind of abstract from these everyday visceral activities uh, to uh, construct uh, mathematics. But uh, so mathematics does have this beauty that's cold and austere, as Russell uh, claimed, but it comes from uh, much muddier, visceral, everyday stuff, uh, which is... So, so uh, it, 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 in a sense, then, uh, what you're adding to... Uh, uh, to the discussion is that it, these examples do bring to life the abstract principles and knowledge that are being conveyed. In which you 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 read and you write in order to see the example list, and from that you start to have a better idea of how that overall context is working. I think that's uh, fair to say, yes. Um, I mean, my, my background is kind of anomalous for a mathematician because I majored for a while in English and philosophy and so on. And uh, I always had a kind of perhaps broader conception of mathematics and, and didn't focus uh, the way uh, many very good mathematicians do on you know, some particular aspect of uh, you know, some topic in algebraic topology or whatever. But um, again, Russell was uh, was an influence because not only was he uh, a logician, but uh, he also uh, <clears throat> engaged with uh, uh, the topics of the times. He was a philosopher, of course, but also uh, involved in social issues of various sorts and uh, was a conscientious objector in World War I and uh, later on got involved in, in politics. So in that sense, he was uh, an idol of mine uh, for many reasons. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, Bertrand Russell was uh, a towering figure for the kind of first half of the 20th century in, in terms of a thought leader, an original thinker, authored 70 books, several thousand essays, and had his uh, views on why I'm Not a Christian, which is an essay. I think one of the, the book's uh, essays that you pointed out that may have had some influence on your own book, Irreligion. Maybe you'd like to draw a parallel there. Uh, right. I think uh, I mean, Why I'm Not a Christian also, uh, I mean, he you know, talks about the arguments for God and shows where they they fall short and uh, has a kind of very polemical conclusion to the book that I always liked. 
And uh, yeah, yeah, it, of course, uh, influence uh, that and many other books that uh, influence my book, Your Religion, which looks at the uh, you know most common arguments for the existence of God and points out the lacunae that uh, uh, exist in in all of them. And uh, so. Uh, <laughs> Apparently, when, when Russell died, there were a number of obituaries that included a quote that he had written uh, long before about his three passions in life. First was the longing for love. Second was the search for knowledge. And third, an unbearable pity for the suffering of mankind. I'm, and I'm wondering whether it's these principles that are attracted you to Russell's writings and have influenced your own writing subsequently? In some sense, too. He also wrote, uh, you know, uh, knowledge, the world needs knowledge, kindliness, and courage. And uh, I think there's something to be said for that. I mean, uh, knowledge, of course, and uh, unfortunately, it's kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, has been devalued in recent times and here in, in this country. Kindliness uh, doesn't uh, exist too much on Twitter, at least, and, and not in the broader body politic. And courage uh, is certainly lacking in uh, America and in, uh, the U.S. Congress. So uh, we're uh, deficient in knowledge, kindliness, and courage. And hopefully uh, that's a, a deficiency that will be remedied remedy to some extent, but uh, is always going to be a problem. John, tell us about uh, when you were 10 years old and you had a correspondence with Bertrand Russell. Tell us that story. No, I, yeah, actually, it was older. I was, in, I was in high school. Okay. And I had read a, a history of Western philosophy. And uh, there was, uh, Russell uh, hated the obfuscation that he said uh, – it was typical of Hegel that uh, it was muddy, turgid, and so so on. And there were some uh, clear philosophical arguments in Hegel, one of which was for a kind of monism. Uh, and uh, and I so I, I wrote him as uh, when I was in high school, like junior or senior in high school, I wrote him, and uh, and what was wrong? I mean, the, the nub of what's wrong with Hegel's argument. And he wrote back, much to my surprise, and I mean, he might have been flattered. He was very old at the time, and he gets this kind of fan letter from a kid in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. But anyway, he answered me, and he said, uh, you know, it had to do with uh, Hegel thinking all, all senses were the subject, predicate variety, and that relations weren't real. I mean, it's kind of a technical point. But I was so flattered that he, uh, he answered me. But the next year, I was at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and the third volume of his autobiography had come out, and I noticed there was a pile of them, and uh, one of them was opened to the very page where he answers me. He, he included the answer, uh, the letter he wrote to me in the third volume of his autobiography, uh, which was, one, it was surprising that he wrote me, and two, surprising he put his answer to me in his autobiography, and the mention of me is sandwiched between such 20th century luminaries as uh, Wittgenstein and Nehru and a whole host of others, so it, it seemed particularly flattering. But it was also very mysterious, like, why should the book be open to that very page? Uh, <clears throat> uh, and perhaps somebody knew me, but I was a freshman, and I, know, I doubt anybody at the bookstore would know me. I think it was just a coincidence, but... Um, uh, nevertheless, it, uh, it would, would you encourage better. others to write authors with questions like that as in other words, to, uh, connect with the people who are actually writing the book that is having some influence on you. I mean, it's much easier to do today than it would have been when you were uh, in junior high school. Uh, yeah, I, I, I would, I mean, uh, it, it, especially with, uh, Email, it's, it's not all that intrusive. I mean, if an uh, author doesn't like it, it's easy enough to, to delete. But, uh, yeah, I think most authors uh, would appreciate uh, letters from younger people in particular. And um, 
And you have nothing to lose. I mean, I, I wrote a number of letters. Uh, wrote a letter to John Updike. I remember he wrote it after I read his uh, Rabbit series books, and uh, he wrote a very nice note back. I've written others as well. And uh, I remember uh, the Saul Bellow's uh, novel, uh, Herzog, uh, which the main character uh, writes letters, spends half the book writing letters to, to people as he's kind of floundering. And, uh, and I, I remember being impressed by, by, by that. So, in a sense, the, the letter writing is an extension of the reading experience. You're reaching out to someone who's written something that's uh, had some impact on you, and there's either a clarification or you you just wish to express gratitude for, for what you learned from their book. I'm certain that you must get a fair number of letters from young people who are readers of your books uh, so that the tradition uh, continues. I do, and I, I'm always... Uh touched by them and uh, and uh, always write back too. I mean, it's easy enough on email. You, you, uh, you're you a well-known super author as well. I mean, you must receive uh, letters about uh, your uh, Calvino uh, uh, creation as well as other books and columns you've written. And do you write back? Yes, of course, I, I do. Because it seems to me anytime someone can immerse themselves in a world that you've created, in my case, fictional world, and take that world to be real and tangible and have an impact on their actual analog life. I, I take that as someone who is a serious reader, who is reaching out, who's trying to explore, who's trying to understand better. And I think that's that's the process in which we grow intellectually and emotionally. We have a better sense of who we are, a better theory of mind. I have a better theory of mind of my readers. And I'm certain th it must be a similar process for you as well. Why don't we turn to David Hume, uh, a very famous 18th century Scottish uh, writer, again, who had an incredible amount of impact at the... Uh, flowering of the uh, Enlightenment in, uh, in Britain as well as in Europe. And I, I know that uh, he's had an impact on you and your writing, and maybe you'd like to tell us a little bit about how David Hume fits into the matrix of your original thinking. Well, I was attracted, of course, to his uh, skepticism. And uh, he was like the 18th century uh, Bertrand Russell, in, well, in many ways. But uh, I mean, his writing on uh, on miracles, for example, I remember a quote of his, uh, something like, uh, no testimony uh, is sufficient uh, to establish uh, a, a miracle unless that the testimony is... Uh, is of such a kind that it, it, its falsehood would be more miraculous than the, than the fact itself. So, uh, I mean, uh, two things happen. I mean, Jesus walked on water or the scriptural re reports of the event are false. I mean, which is the greater miracle? I think the greater miracle was that he walked on water. So, therefore, it's uh, you reject that. But, um, I mean, they... they I, you know, so his his writings about uh, miracles and how you could dismiss them, and you always look for the the uh, greater probability. Uh, his notion is kind of quasi Buddhist notions of self. Uh, self is just a collection of uh, properties, a bundle of properties, and there's nothing more to it. Uh, the, the self is most people conceive it as kind of a chimera. The, there is no self. Uh, it's a collection and. Um, it's it's kind of uh, always struck me as kind of uh, as I say quasi Buddhist, and um, it's um, and, and his notion of cause is just being constant conjunction and so on. So I mean his kind of demolition of traditional uh, notions, whether uh, cause, miracles, uh, 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 self, uh, appeal to me and um, and. Yeah, I've always uh, admired his skepticism, and he was also involved in uh, in the world. I mean, he, he wrote some 
well-known histories, of, uh, as well as uh, engaged in some political uh, 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 discussions and affairs. So uh, he, uh, in some sense, was you know very loosely mm. speaking, uh, a kind of 18th century Russell. Have, have, have uh, Hume and Russell again the. Both of them seem to be linked with their uh, skepticism about how you yeah. approach certain issues. That the skeptic would look at the notion of having a designer, a supreme being, and mysticism and superstition in a particular way. To what extent do we find, or do you find, that Hume, as well as Russell, continue to have relevance and importance? in a modern technological world where it seems that skepticism is is kind of consigned to one group of people but not widely accepted? Or is it that we are now in the ultimate skeptical age? Which is it? Are we too skeptical or not skeptical enough? Uh, I don't know. It's hard to say. Probably uh, it's kind of a dodge, but probably both. I mean, uh uh, many people aren't skeptical enough, hence uh, the popularity of QAnon. Or actually, there was an uh, uh, article in the New York Times today. It was very kind of uh, uncritically uh, uh, accepting of uh, astrology, which is, you know, I think the Times should be embarrassed for having published that. So, in any case, there are a lot. I mean, there's a lot of gullibility. I mean, look at the. Uh, you know, uh, 70 million people uh, looked at everything Trump did for the last four years, and they say, "Yep, he's our man." And um, you know, that, that's you know, that's unfortunate. And on the other hand, there are some people who are, uh, you know, you, you can be too skeptical, too too snarky, too uh, uh, ready to dismiss almost anything. Uh, and would you see that? Oh, sorry, what? Would Would you see that? Uh, Hume or Russell, both of them, as being uh, good teachers uh, of skepticism that, uh, that can be used today by, say, young people, students or, or ordinary people who want to see kind of a framework of how you can be skeptical without being snarky? Uh, perhaps, yeah. I, I think uh, there, was, there are a lot of guys. Uh, philosopher, skeptical writers in general. I mean, look at uh, Daniel Den Dennett, uh, Richard Dawkins, a whole host of so-called new atheists. So, I mean, they're, they're out there, it's, but you have to be open to it. And, uh, you know, I mean, the United States is very, uh, I mean, a huge fraction of the United States are evangelicals, and I don't think that they're open to um, entertaining this. And, uh, I mean, marginally I, I, relevant. I was, I, sorry, I was, I was starting to say well, one uh, quote that I always liked. I mean, it's marginally relevant to this issue, but also you know, related ones. And uh, let me see if I can get it right. It's something like uh, uh, the the worst. Uh, wait a minute. No, the, the best lack all conviction, while the, the worst are full of passionate intensity. And I think that's that's still the case. I mean. Uh, uh, you know, people always get very aroused and angry, and usually they're, they're they don't know what they're talking about. And the people who do are always tentative and say, "Well, maybe," and, and they, I'm not sure yet. And um, unfortunately, you you have that kind of um, uh, division. I mean, the best people are naturally tentative. Science is tentative, but that doesn't mean that you know it's not the source of most of what we know, whereas the people who don't know anything are always cocksure of everything. And, sure. Um, yeah, I, I, there, there is a difference between those who put air bars around what they are thinking to be real and those who assume that there are no air bars if you have faith and belief in a particular <laughs> ideology or a religion. Well, uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, let, let's let, let's look at Martin Gardner, many puzzle books. What I like about this guy is he published over an 80-year career. I mean, that's a long, long career. Uh, titles yeah. such 
as 12 tricks with a borrowed deck, mathematics, magic, and mystery, logic, machines, and diagrams, and my favorite, never make fun of a turtle, my son. So how did Martin Gardner, who seemed to have an enormous amount of respect and admiration by generations of mathematicians come into your life? I came across a couple of his books, and then I went and bought as many of them as I could find, which was, you know, as you indicated, a, a large number. And, uh, and yeah, I uh, liked the, the fact that it was mathematical, that it was funny, that there were jokes, that uh, 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 little physics problems, uh, card tricks, uh, and uh, riddles of various forms, uh, and uh, and I, I, as I say, I, I like to always. Uh, I mean, I always noted the connection between mathematics and humor, which seems. Uh, strange to many people's ears, but as I indicated before, there are lots of similarities. Um, uh, it's economical, uh, there's mm -hmm. logic, pattern, structure, cleverness, and so on. Taking things literally is, uh, is a habit that most mathematicians have, and uh, make a lot of jokes by taking things literally. I remember I was last summer, I was watching uh, The Three Stooges, which I loved as a kid with my uh, two, grand two of my grandsons. And I was pleased to see that they found the same things I found hilarious a long time ago. I remember they were laughing their heads off when uh, Larry asked uh, Mo, or Mo asked Larry, what, what does your clock say? And I said, what time is it? And he said, what does your clock say? And, and, Mo, and Larry goes, tick, 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 tick. <laughs> I mean, it's <laughs> stupid, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, I liked it and he liked it. So I, I guess what I'm hearing you say, John, is yeah. that in, in a way, Martin Gardner was a was a kind of a mentor to you in yeah. terms of how you approach mathematics through puzzles, through humor, through example. And again, that is from the world of books. In other words, you found someone who on the written page could become a real life mentor for you and allowed you a portal into the mathematical world that was absolutely suited emotionally and intellectually for your, your skills. I think so. And actually, I, I mentioned earlier that writing letters to uh, celebrities or uh, well-known people. I wrote Martin Gardner a few times, and then we had this uh, uh, correspondence uh, dealing with... Uh, uh, dirty jokes. He had a whole collection of dirty jokes. Uh, and, I mean, weren't you know, they weren't offensive? I mean, not, at least not to me. And uh, I, he, he sent me some of his the best ones. And I, I you know, he, he was a good guy. I, I, glad he lived to a ripe old age. And um, yeah, he was a, a kind of uh, mentor. Would you recommend his books now to young people who are in school? Uh, yeah, I would. I, I think uh, the mathematics that's taught in schools should definitely be supplemented by I mean, uh, uh, all kinds of popular science writing. You can get ideas across. And, um, yeah, I, I think it's important to uh, – I mean, it's a little bit like uh, – I mean, if you don't do that and you just stick to uh, solving equations and formulas with fixed uh, algorithms – um, it's, a, it's a little bit like teaching English uh, and only talking about uh, uh, grammar, diagramming sentences, and never reading a work of literature. I mean, if that's the case, you wouldn't have uh, too keen an appreciation of literature when you got to college. But uh, something analogous to that is, to, in many places, uh, fortunately fewer than in the past, in many places still just focuses on uh, on algorithms, uh, very simple algorithms, and uh, you know how to invert a matrix or you know, how to do this or that, and uh, and ignores the analog of literature and, and mathematics, which is uh, unfortunate. And one way to get part of that literature is Martin Gardner, but there are all kinds of popular books on, on chaos theory and uh, 
probability and everyday life and um, topology and so on. And I think that uh, those, uh, you know, for a uh, student who's interested in mathematics, those, those should be read to supplement uh, uh, school mathematics. Let's move on to uh, the next, uh, I'm not quite certain how to characterize this, but Mad Magazine, the comic books, which were published 67 years between 1952 and 2018. Over 550 regular magazine issues and countless special issues. And it's been said that Mad Magazine really shaped uh, the mental processes of a whole generation and, and is responsible for a number of the aspects of the 1960s where suddenly people were seeing that there were a lot of phonies around, that the teachers weren't telling the truth, the government wasn't telling the truth, that we were in a Cold War, toothpaste ads were propaganda, and that nothing could be trusted from authority. Now, clearly this resonates, I think, with you, John, and maybe go back a little bit to the, to the beginning when you first started reading that magazine and how the, that experience influenced you. Well, yeah, you, you got it right there, that the irreverent sensibility of Mad Magazine, uh, I, I liked a lot. And I, I guess I was, a, in, a, in some sense at least, not in all senses, a, a child of the 60s. And... Um, yeah, that uh, I I liked it, I, I, and um, not, not not just that, but uh, comic books I like. I, I, I mean, and they're, they're kind of not great literature, as, <laughs> as everybody knows. But uh, Superman, superheroes, even uh, Archie, Jughead, Reggie, and so on. Um, you know, I, uh, I I think there's something to be. Uh, value. I mean, they don't. Really, I, nobody reads comic books anymore. I'm not even sure they're being produced. But uh, superheroes, they, some are. But uh, yeah, Mad Magazine, comic books. Um, I mean, uh, and there's a kind of a continuum between such things and real literature. I mean, remember um, uh, there was a television program in the uh, late fifties, Cisco Kid, and uh, that made me. Uh, uh, it got me to read Don Quixote, at least a simplified version of it that was available at my uh, local library. But, you know, uh, Cisco Kid, uh, kind of, you know, run of the mill, uh, but funny, a television show uh, induced me to read Don Quixote. So, I mean, there's a continuum. I don't think we should be too dismissive or too snarky or snide about uh, comic books or Mad Magazine or... Uh, uh, any written stuff that's not great literature. Is Mad Magazine something that you can go back, say, as a young person today and read it and have the same kind of relationship between those messages? I'm thinking of our technology when we're, we're so much of the uh, discourse about false fronts, fake news, deceptions, booby traps, ambushes are now you know, batted back and forth in seconds uh, amongst total strangers. That is not the mad, the, the mad uh, magazine world. Yeah, no, I, I don't think it would have the same appeal today. It's, uh, it's too, uh, it was from a more innocent time. I, I, I don't think it would, uh, kids today would uh, respond to it in, in the same way. It's... Um, I mean, just as you look at uh, old television shows that were popular and they, they seem so dated, and, and many of them, not all of them, but it's so dated and uh, the, the the wisecracks and the jokes uh, come much less frequently. Every few minutes somebody says something, whereas now people are used to much snappier, faster-paced uh, sitcoms. And uh, people are more cynical and uh, than they were in the 50s and 60s. So I, I, I think it But I'm seeing, a little bit of, I'm seeing a little bit of a trend here, John, and Russell Hume and now Matt Magazine. And it's basically looking at the origin of your original mind. It really is a, a deep dive into the world of skepticism 
that is reflected with different voices and different authors at different times. Is that fair? I think so, yeah. I, uh, yeah. In fact, I, I remember as a kid, I mean, I was, I, I, I don't really have a religious bone in my body. I never understood religion. But just running around saying what would be being sacrilegious things, running around in the, in the playground. I, I don't know. But, um, yeah, and, but skepticism in general. I mean, uh, uh, whether it be of, uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah, I, I think skepticism. So would you would you think, say you're reading history that a major source of developing this sense of skepticism came from your reading? I think so, probably. I mean, I was naturally disposed uh, to resonate with such uh, ideas, and uh, I didn't come from a religious household. My father was an agnostic. My mother occasionally went to church, but I think just for other reasons. And uh, even that I didn't understand. But, um, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think uh, I had a natural disposition to it, and that, that disposition was nourished and flourished um, uh, in, in large part because of what I've read. Now to something that's uh, quite different, which is not the world of skepticism, but the world of war, Ted Lawson, 30 Seconds Over Tokyo, which is uh, the, the story of an eyewitness account who participated in the 1942 Doolittle raid over Tokyo, where 16 B-25 bombers hit industrial targets in Japan at close range. The mission was a success. And this is a book that uh, others have said uh, was a lifelong uh, love affair with war novels and history. How does it fit into the way your mind works? In other words, you've chosen this book as being kind of a special influence. How, how did that work? Uh, I, it was just a very good story. I think I reread it uh, three or four times, and uh, <clears throat> it's a very compelling story, sad story. <clears throat> Lawson, the, the author, lost his leg, and uh, many people died, uh, even though it was a successful mission. But it's a very dramatic, compelling, real, true story, and um, it you know it doesn't fit in particularly to my uh, skeptical framework, but. Uh, I mean, it's interesting, though, how, how people change. I mean, I, you know, I went into the Peace Corps to Kenya to avoid the draft I, uh, in, in Vietnam. And um, in any case, but at the, when I was younger, I really enjoyed this. I enjoyed war movies. I had uh, toy soldiers, which I made I used to. Uh, recreate battle scenes. I, I made model airplanes and painted them very carefully and put on decals and had them fly over my, uh, tack them to the ceiling above the, my bed. And, um, and uh, so, I mean, that's, you know, people change. I mean, but, you know, I was interested and to some extent still am in, in war movies. I mean, war is a very compelling subject, no matter what your age. And, um, one of the things I'm hearing you say, John, is that the reason you've gone back and, and reread this book a number of times is that there's something in the structure of the storytelling that compels your attention, that you want to go back and be immersed in that world. Is that perhaps one of the reasons that reading is important is that it helps one conceptualize a structure for telling a story in a compelling emotional way. Yeah, of course. And I, on top of that, it was it was true. It was a real story. It was about World War II, where there was uh, very little uh, gray. Uh, it was black and white. Uh, and um, and so it was a war that, uh, unlike, let's say, Afghanistan or Vietnam, where there's, you know, where it's kind of, Vague where the lines are, um, uh, it was easier to 
to be kind of gung ho about World War II mm-hmm. books and movies. I'd uh, like to turn then to certainly one of my favorite authors, and that's George Louis Borges. The Library of Babel, Borges and I, and Labyrinths are some of the uh, essays of Borges that you have selected out. And I thought it would be interesting to find out how those have shaped your worldview, because Borges is one of those uh, legendary writers who was very brief. Most of his uh, stories are five, six pages. A lot of them are just two or three pages long. But what's packed well, inside of them is volumes. Tell well, us a little bit about he, your... Yeah. I, I think the, the brevity of his stories and, uh, was one of the reasons he never got a Nobel Prize in literature since uh, uh, I think Nobel Committee doesn't value brevity as much as, as I do. But uh, no, the, the themes of his books were, uh, you know, ones uh, I was interested in. I mean, Infinity and mirrors and identity and metafiction, logic, and, um, you know, free will. I mean, the, 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 the Library of Babel, I mean, in particular, I, mean, uh, I like it because of, uh, you know, I mean, he does a great job of painting the library, these hexagonal uh, uh, compartments, and uh, every book in the world is there as well, there, as, well as every perversion of every book and random, uh, random symbols. Uh, I mean, it, it was, everything was there. So in, in effect, uh, uh, in a way, the library was, <laughs> was useless because every true uh, novel had, uh, you know, Eight zillion and ten uh, kind of perversions uh, and uh, permutations of the letters, uh, just random letters. So there's so much information in a way that uh, it was uh, it was useless. But yet the, the writing is compelling, not just in, in this story, but in other different stories. And and the stories are a little bit like like jokes in the sense that you know they're, they're brief. He tells the thing and. Uh, and it uh, carries a real punch at the end, or even through the whole thing. Yeah, I, I could see where, uh, particularly the Library of Babel would appeal to you because of the brevity yeah. and also because of the kind of the paradox. In this infinitely large library, there's one volume that reveals the secret of the library, but there's no filing system. So no one can find that book. And through all eternity, all the people in this library are looking for a book that can never be found. Or, so it creates or that kind there. of appearance. Right, but the, in addition to that book are books that give the wrong directions. So, right. I mean, in a way, it's useless. It, it's full of fake news. I mean, yes, yes. So it, 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 it's a superstition and, um, and cult-like behavior because everything is there. Anything you want to believe, I mean, Confirmation bias, you know, run wild. So in that sense, it was useless. But uh, yeah, no, I, I always uh, liked uh, his stories. Uh, um, I, I like Borges and I too, but because of the distinction between you know the public Borges and uh, his his uh, his personality, his private personality. I mean, knowledge by acquaintance and not knowledge by description, to use Russell's term. And uh, and that's short. That's 300 words. Um, and uh, that's a beautiful little essay. Yeah, it's, it, it, it is amazing. And again, that seems to be fitting a pattern that we're discovering about your reading, John, is that these highly imaginative people are creating worlds within a very few words, but are profoundly rich, textured, deep explorations of what it is to be a human being. Right. Yeah, I'm very impatient with novels that are too long. I mean, uh, I mean sometimes it's okay. I mean, I, there's some long novels that I have really enjoyed, but in general, I prefer brevity. Right. Okay. Anything else about Borges? I mean, I, 
Is Borgay being read these days? Should Borgay be read these days? He should be, but I, I, I don't know. I uh, don't have a, a good feeling for whether he is or isn't. Uh, I, again, every generation, I mean, finds his own heroes, but uh, our own uh, whatever. But um, I don't know. My impression, my, my guess would be he's not being read that much right now, but he might be. I, I read I, part of some of his in in Spanish. I, I can. I, I can't speak uh, Spanish. I, uh, my accent is horrible, and if I say something correct, um, people, you know, get the illusion that I'm uh, fluent and start babbling really rapidly. But I can read Spanish, and um, I, I've read some of Borges in Spanish, which I enjoy even more. Partly because I, I have to read it slowly, and I have to savor every line in a way that I don't when I read English, because I kind of zip through it. So, uh, yeah. so I, I guess that's, it's, it's a, it, another uh, point is that when you uh, are reading in another language, the reading experience is different because perhaps you slow down and the way you assimilate is going to be different because there's a different thought structure that goes with each language. I think so, yeah. I think they're going slowly and uh, having to go slowly. Yeah. You have to think about what you're doing, especially since if, if uh, your language skills aren't, if you're not perfectly fluent, uh, maybe the initial literal translation doesn't make sense. You think about it a little bit and say, oh, uh, here's a more colloquial translation. Oh, that's a, that's a really insightful remark in a way that, as I say, you probably wouldn't in English. You might hurry by. You know, I worry a little bit about the intellectual development and reading history now because there is a premium on speed and what has happened in the last 24 hours that our attention is now so overwhelmed with the absolute avalanche of information and knowledge that flows across the screen every day that the question that viewers may have is I don't have time to read these old books I can't keep up with what has happened in the last 24 hours on the planet. How do you respond to that? I think that's true. It's a little bit like uh, Borges' library. I mean, there's so much there, you can you know, find what you want. I mean, well, one of the uh, reasons for proliferation of fake news is one, the internet, and two is uh, uh, various uh, biases. Uh, and, um, and another is uh, uh, one particular bias, it, it can, uh, the conjunction fallacy. I mean, it's uh, the, the probability of two or three events is going to be much smaller than the probability of one event, uh, one of those three events, but it's all often more plausible. So, I mean, if you tell a story, if you, you get a bunch of factoids from the Internet, you can weave them into a story, and they're... Uh, and the probability of that story is probably very low because you know, it's the probability of each of those components being true. So the probability of many things being true is much less than the probability of just one thing being true. But uh, what you uh, so you're less likely to be true, but it's more plausible. I mean, if you want to lie, forget the news. If you want to lie, put in a lot of details, and uh, it makes your lie less likely, um, less likely to be true but more plausible. So uh, if there are lots of details lying around in the library of uh, Babel or in the internet, which is a present day library of Babel, uh, it's not gonna be hard to uh, construct them into whatever kind of uh, uh, beliefs you, you have. And, uh, Let's turn to a moment to Franz Kafka, Metamorphosis, the trial, a hunger artist. Uh, Metamorphosis yeah. in particular, this transformation of a human being into uh, a giant beetle and the kind of disgrace and outsider position that this uh, person then faced. Uh, again, fit this into the overall John Paulus reading universe of how this came into your life and what influence it's had. Uh, I don't know how I fit it in. I mean, I'm interested not only in skepticism, so it doesn't really fit in. It's a compelling story. It's very intriguing. It's very disturbing. 
and they, it's open to all kinds of interpretation, whether religious, psychological, whether uh, the father is uh, crucial, the sister is, you know, is evil, uh, his passivity. I mean, there's, all, there's enough there that uh, uh, you can interpret it. Like, like any good story, uh, it's you know, open to all kinds of uh, interpretations. And uh, likewise with the, the, the trial. I mean, um, I, you know, my reaction to it was a standard one of fear of bureaucracy and so on. But actually, I was reading this book on the so-called alignment problem. And artificial intelligence and machine learning. They teach machines, you know, you give them all kinds of data from newspapers to uh, websites and so on, and the machines learn. But often what they learn does not align with the, the values of, of people who I assume are implicit in all that news. And often they construct um, programs that are overtly racist or whatever. So you can have rules, maybe the rules in the trial made sense, but it led to, you know, uh, the, uh, the problems, that, uh, the, the dire uh, dead ends that the protagonist uh, ran into in the trial. But uh, I mean, that's another thing about uh, stories. I mean, you can, uh, when you read them, gives you uh, a different, uh, I mean, nobody who had Kafka up until you know, very recently uh, uh, related it to the so-called alignment problem. But uh, that, that's that's a way to look at a small part of the story. Yeah, I think it's, it's also uh, an interesting way to look at Kafka as well, is that if you, you know, Metamorphosis really is a kind of a, 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 an alienation story within a family uh, where the trial is a larger alienation story in a political context where you have an authority that has this absolute control and power over you, doesn't have to give explanations, doesn't have to give reasons, can act in a, in a way that uh, asserts authority and power without having to account for what it's doing to an individual. So in, in a sense, there's this, uh, the, the two are, are have a connection in terms of the alienation from the world and how someone emotionally and intellectually deals with that, that non-alignment with what we believe should be the world and the way the world really is. Right. I agree totally. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Uh, not to go too deep in the weeds on your uh, AI argument, but I think it's a good one. I was reading the other day that one of the things about AI, a super intelligent AI, is that it would know every domain. It would have access to all statistics, all of the data, all the information about every domain, so that it's predictability would be of what happens next would be vastly richer and easier than a human being. We stumble around, we are within, you know, usually uh, one domain or maybe two or three domains, but even within those domains, there are gaps, uh, big gaps in what we know and what we can know. So that what we're looking at is uh, in terms of an AI intelligence, is that ability to reduce the size of those gaps. We do it through reading, AI does it through vast amounts of combing through de- data and information. Okay, well, I'll go along with that, but uh, I mean, there is this connection. And, um, right. <laughs> let's, yeah. let's look at Yoko Ogawa, the <laughs> housekeeper and the professor. I like. I like the the premise of this book, and I could see why it would have an impact on you. It's it's the story of a mathematician who's said to be elderly when he's 64, who has a housekeeper, who finds that her new employer basically only has a short-term memory that's good for about 80 minutes, and after that he forgets. So she has to introduce herself to him every day as if it is the first day. It's a little bit like Groundhog Day, I guess, in that way, at least from the perspective of the mathematician. 
So Amen. why did you choose this particular book to talk about? Uh, well, I, I, I read it uh, at a later age, I mean, but, uh, well, partly because of the mathemat uh, mathematician who was one of the uh, protagonists, the other being the housekeeper. I mean, this mathematician had a car, uh, was involved in a car accident, had uh, suffered severe brain damage, but it did not affect his intelligence in the least. He was a brilliant mathematician, but he, his short-term memory was about an hour and a half. And as you just said, the housekeeper I mean, hired, uh, uh, along with her son, came and took care of them, and he would pin notes, uh, she would pin notes on his uh, suit uh, to remind him he would pin notes and um, and he would explain uh, basic uh, uh, number theory to uh, her son, and he was a very kindly kindly guy, and uh, his personality and his uh, intelligence, uh, you know, remained the same. And it um, it uh, it just struck me. He he, uh, he spent his time sharing. Uh, in return for their taking care of them, he shared the, the beauty of, uh, of um, mathematics. He showed why they're into many times or why they're this or that uh, uh, number theoretical fact uh, held. And the son would appreciate it, and so would she, and they would take them out. And it was a very, you know, kind of a little love story, chase love story between the housekeeper and uh, the mathematician. Yeah, I, I thought it was kind of an, an, an interesting choice as well, because it, sh it showed someone who had this brilliant original mind suffered from a major disability and it somehow dealing with that disability humanized him and humanized the household. Right. It was. It's a, it's a very nice book. It's, uh, uh, have you read it? I haven't read it, but I think after uh, this interview, I am going to go out and get a copy of it because it, uh, you know, that, that basic theme of what makes us human isn't so much of what we remember, but is who we are despite memory lapses. And that right. the kind of patience that's required for people to have around someone who has a disability is as a particular kind of gift. Some people have that and some people don't. And this particular yeah. book, it seems to be a teaching lesson of how you accommodate your life to someone who has a missing aspect of what we take to be in a normal human relationship and how you find bridges to overcome those those obstacles. Right. And it's full of little insights about uh, things that you wouldn't uh, realize since your our memories last for longer than an hour and a half. <laughs> but yeah, I, I recommend it highly. The, the other uh, novelist that you uh, have on your list is Saul Bellow. Uh, her talk, The Adventures of Augie March, and... He's written many, many books, and I could understand why Herzog would appeal in The Great Sufferer, The Joker, The Mourner, The Charmer. Uh, he's yeah, also a teacher writer. and a father, uh, and he displays, this is from the book, The Pride of the Peacock, The Lust of a Goat, and The Wrath of the Lion. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I, I like uh, Saul Bell, not, not just Herzog, but uh, Augie March and um, The Dangling Man and so on, and uh, Humboldt's Gift. And uh, he, as, he was you know, an amazing writer. I mean, uh, even if you didn't like the story or didn't agree, I mean, he, he was uh, uh, a, a phenomenal wordsmith. And uh, just, just a little snippet you read is is evidence of that. And uh, and I, I also like the predicaments a lot of his characters are in, including in Herzog and Dangling Man, uh, someone that, uh, you know, just kind of dangling, trying to model through. And, um, yeah, I, I, I like well, Philip I, Roth as well. 
Yeah, I, I can understand uh, the, the connection, certainly, between uh, Philip Roth and, and Saul Bellow and why you would be attracted to that. I, I'm curious as well to kind of explore a little bit the difference between entering that fiction world of imagination and yeah. the world of the more abstract uh, theoretical from the David Hume and, and the Bertrand Russell, that we take different things away from both worlds. You know, what is it? about the fiction that you've read f over a lifetime that have helped shape that kind of original way of dealing with people. Because in a sense, fiction is about our social relationships, of how we behave with one another, what our expectations are, how we read the mind of other people. That's not clear. I don't know. Uh, I, I enjoyed the... I enjoyed the the words, just the pure words of uh, Bello, Philip Roth, John Updike, and um, as well as the stories. I'm not, uh, and uh, perhaps they somehow deepened my understanding of people, uh, but I don't really uh, I mean, have any specific examples, but uh, I suspect they, they have in a, in a sense. I mean, that uh, widens your, your range of uh, acquaintances. Or, Friends, in a sense. I mean, you can only be friends or acquaintances with uh, uh, you know, relatively small number of people. So uh, literature expands your circle of uh, of people that you, that you know in some sense. And knowing that it's often, in a sense, more intimate than the people that you actually do know in real life. So, I've uh, always found uh, Bello kind of uh, someone hot with uh, des desire, a certain level of kind of a aggression of going into the world with certain preconceived ideas of battering. It's full of conflict. And, and as a result, you come away with that feeling a little emotionally exhausted. Here is someone who really has gone 15 rounds and taken punches and thrown punches in each of those rounds. Uh, I see what you mean. Yeah, I think that, that that's true. I, I, I like Mordecai Rickler for the same reason. Yeah, some of his characters, and Barney's version in particular, are like uh, Bellow characters. But I know he's Canadian, so... Uh, yes, he is. Like him too. Yeah. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I, I think it does enrich you in, in hard to specify ways, which it doesn't mean that it, it doesn't. It just uh, at least I find it hard to say. But uh, I feel like I, I know, you know, I'm not just Bellow. But the more you read uh, novels, the, the more people you know in some sense. And um, are, I think that, Would you consider a yourself a lifelong reader? Are you still uh, reading daily uh, books at or are you being pulled into the world of social media? Well, I'm being pulled into the world of social media, but I, I still read. I'm reading a book now, The Japanese Lover by Isabel Allende. And again, I'm reading it in, in Spanish. And uh, so I'm, I'm, still, I'm still reading, although less than I did when I was younger because of the energy sink that social media, Twitter in particular, uh, are. <laughs> But I, hopefully I, that, that uh, my uh, involvement, at least in Twitter, will diminish uh, once uh, Trump is gone. Do you, I <laughs> wonder if you, might have, if, if you might have a message for uh, young people watching this uh, and old people as well, is how important is it to continue to integrate book reading into your life? Uh, and into the life of children around you? I think it's it's very important, but I think it's more difficult than it has been. I mean, it's not it's not a reading culture anymore. I mean, uh, uh, because of the appeal, the temptation to just sit back, and watch uh, uh, television. There's some amazing series on television, just watching The Crown. I mean, it's full of uh, personal uh, stories and historical uh, events. And uh, it's, a, it's a different modality. I mean, in a sense, uh, you're, you're 
reading. It's just that uh, you're watching television. I mean, of course, you could watch junk too, but um, you know, book. It, it's it's not a reading culture anymore, which that doesn't isn't necessarily cause for despair or pessimism, uh, because there are there's an amazing uh, wealth of material, a series on on television, some really amazing stuff. But I think books will always be around, and uh, and uh, and <clears throat> we shouldn't forget about them. And I think people should continue to read, even with uh, the temptation of. Uh, uh, with social media and the alternative modality of television and movies, but uh, I, I think will last. I think you know one of the things with uh, the explosion of Netflix and, and and other providers of of high quality uh, TV is is it having an impact on how our imaginations are being formed. When you read a book, particularly read a novel, you're recreating that environment, yeah. those relationships, yeah. so those expressions and gestures in your own mind. In other words, you are making the movie of the book as you're reading the book. Yeah. When you're watching a TV series, it's prepackaged for you. Your, yeah. your imagination is, is boxed within uh, the screen that someone else has uh, shot and edited and scored. I, that, that, that's definitely the case. That, that co <clears throat> uh, connects with the point I made earlier about uh, reading uh, novels in Spanish. I, you know, I have to spend more time and I have to recreate it. I mean, there's more, uh, a greater element of recreation because I'm reading it so slowly and kind of putting it together. So um, I, I think that's true. And books require that, whereas uh, even the best television series does not. So it's a more passive undertaking to watch television than it is to, uh, to read a book. So do you have a message for the future? Let's, let's direct this to 30 years from now. It's now 2050. What would you want to say to people in 2050 about the importance of reading in order to train the mind to create that mind from the 400 gram beginning to the 1.5 kilo end? Uh, I, I won't be so presumptuous. Uh, I think that I can probably say anything of value to someone living in 2050. I mean, uh, you yeah. know, read, open up. Uh, I'm, I'm sure the people or androids who's ever around then will, uh, come up with their, their, their own ways for coping. But uh, I don't have any particular uh, uh, prediction or words of advice. Um, I have hopes, but uh, it's different. Well, what we're going to do, John, is we're going to uh, put your books, plus uh, a list of books that you have given me that we didn't have a chance to discuss, and we'll put that in a time bottle for 2050. And in 2050, people will be able to look at this interview, look at this list of books, which will be in the show notes, and to say, this was how one original creative mind in the head of John Paulus came about. I want to thank you very All much right. for being on the show and for having this conversation about books. Thank you. I enjoyed it immensely, as I usually do when I speak with you. You take care now, John, and uh, hope to connect with you again very soon. Uh, you, you as well. Stay safe.